Good evening. Mazal tov to Yitzchak and the whole family. Moving to a new house is always a nice Baruch Hashem Simcha. And uh, I wish them that they have a lot of Mazal in this house. Atzlacha, good kids, everything that they need, Bezrat Hashem, Parnasa, the whole family. Now, since he told me that you're already listening to the lectures, and on CDs and on the website. So maybe I'll ask you what you, what you want me to talk about. Maybe you have questions. Maybe, so, you know, it's better that I talk about something that you like than I just talk about something you heard before already. So maybe you take advantage now and you ask me what, what something, questions you have, doubts, problems, you know, you need advice, whatever. Now it's the time. Shalom Bait. That's the problem of everyone. <laughs> I don't buy it. Number one. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Why really almost nobody has Shalom Bait in this generation? Why? It wasn't like this. 50, 60 years ago, it wasn't like this. Too much freedom for women. <laughs> <laughs> Too much freedom for women, he said. Well, you agree with him? No, yeah, yeah, I'm only shy for both. Huh? Too much freedom. Not freedom, too much time. time. Too much time there? Freedom, they must. No, women that work very hard, they still don't have shalom bait. Even when they don't have time and freedom. No, some religious women, they raise their to work, you know. Yes. Why? Because they feel like they're equal with the husband, equal rights. They have to work like a husband, they have to do like a husband. I tell you, he said because the wife and the husband became equal and used to be the men, and now, now it's, uh, it's the husband is more, it's not as important as it used to be. Also, it's not true, because even in houses that the woman is, the, is uh, not the boss, the husband is very tough, it's still no shalom bite, fighting, arguing, violence. Even when the woman is like nothing, even when the woman is nothing, not saying anything, still no shalom bai. Where is my food? Why it's not good? Why I didn't do what I told you? Why I didn't pay the bill? Why you bring your, your annoying parents again? I told you not to invite them. She doesn't make a beep and is still abuser. So it's not, the, not the, it's not the right answer. What is the right answer? Well, thank you. For me, thank you. You read my mind. Good. Oh, Hatad, my Yeah, yeah, maybe a little bit. Yeah. So uh, my question is, that's it. Enough. No, who can answer me? Serious. What do you think is the problem? Why am I asking? What's the problem is? If we don't find the source of the problem, we cannot find the cure. If a doctor wants to cure you, can he cure you without knowing where your problem comes from? No. If we don't know what's the problem in our house, how can we cure, cure it? Selfishness. Selfie. People were selfish for thousands of years already. No, chinuch. What's chinuch? Education. What's from both sides? You mean just in America or world? In the whole world, the whole civilized world. Uh, become divorced, become husband and wife. Every country in the world, every modern country, every modern country, which is uh, Europe, Israel, America, Canada, places like this, but the divorce rate is higher and higher every year. A little bit more, a little bit more, and it's growing. It's already now in a point that there's really no point of getting married. It's already in a point that it's really not the right choice to do. Because if you see that uh, 70, 80 percent of the people who get married suffer, why would you want to raise your, I mean, uh, jeopardize yourself to be in the same situation? Then you come and say, what do you mean? How can I be uh, single? I'm religious. I need a wife. I cannot make sins. So that's really the main reason why people get married today. They need a wife or they want kids, really. Other than that, there was no reason to do it. In, in previous generation, it was great fun. You have a wife. You know, you have a friend to life, you do things together, you love each other, it's great life. So then it's really nothing, it's real roommate, having children together, 
raising their children, more or less it's mo most of the families today are roommates, really there's no marriage, for real marriage. I get to places that I find that the husband and wife have two bank accounts. She works and put money in her account and, and then decide who pays for what. It's not much like roommates. You understand? So the question is, where, where is the source of the problem? If we know the source of the problem, maybe we can save ourselves from this. Maybe. So the non-religious people, really there's no reason for them why to get married. Someone who's not religious and makes sins all the time, what's the point of getting married? Anyway, he's going to cheat in two or three months and continue to make sins. So what did he really need that marriage for? To spend $200,000 on a wedding and then go to court and fight for the kids? What was the point for them of getting married? It's really foolish. I don't understand their logic. If he married her because he loved her and he wants to be with her intimately, no problem. So they can do it as boyfriend and girlfriend anyway, they don't care. They don't know Hashem, they don't know the Torah, they don't know the purpose of life, they don't know what they live for. They don't, they eat, they move, like, like another species in nature. So what, the monkeys need to get married if they want to be together and they want to have kids? The monkeys don't need to get married, they want to have kids, they have kids, finished. I never saw a ceremony in a forest that one monkey marries a female. They want to live together, they want to enjoy together. They want to have children together. You don't need to get married for that. Well, what's going through their mind? They suffer so much after that with a divorce, almost each one of them. So really, it doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not talking about the secular world. The secular world, in my opinion, if they're smart, they should never get married. But I'm talking people who knows now Hashem, who knows the Torah, people like us. People like us who knows, who knows the Torah and... Uh, so people like us who knows the Torah, who knows what's the right thing to do, but we see that many of people like us, they also fail. They also not succeed. Problem all the time, you know, all the, half of the phone calls is speak to my husband. Half of the phone call, speak to my husband. You know why? It's not good, it's not a good husband. So the answer for it is, the answer for it is that people do not understand what marriage was made for. They don't understand what marriage is for. They think marriage is to have a girl that you love and to be together and, then, and you know, that's it. But they don't understand that when Hashem put a man with a woman, the real test of his life begin. How do I know? If you search in the books, you see that when a man comes to Shamaim in front of Hashem, everything that he did in his life is subject to how he was with his wife. Which means, if he was a very good husband, very generous to the whole world, not husband, person, very good person, he helps the whole world, he, you know, he does all kinds of things, he's Baal Tzedakah, he donates, he keeps Shabbat, he helps all kinds of people, but he's not good to his own house, to his own wife and children. Everything he does out there will not count anything for him. Will not count. Why will not count? Because the Torah says the priority in chesed. When you do kindness, first you have to start with your own house, your own wife, and then your children, and then other people. If you have time for your children or for somebody else, your children comes first. No, you cannot go on like this. So, your, your life comes first before other people. You help, go to help somebody else and you don't help in your own house. You have a very serious problem. So it won't count. Plus, now you may ask and say, well, okay, that's me. What about my wife? So the answer is, you have a bigger obligation than your wife. Why man is judging, judged more than a woman about the marriage? Why? Because the only reason the woman is alive is thanks to the man. She was made for the man. She came to assist him. If you have the president or the vice president and something bad happened, who do they blame? The president. Nobody really blames the vice president, even though if the president dies, he becomes the boss of the country. 
But really, when the president uh, decides, even if it was the vice president advice, and he took his advice, and he did it, and something went wrong, everybody blamed the president. Nobody ever speak against the president of the United States. If you have the husband and a wife, and something goes wrong in a house, Hashem first come to the men. It's your fault. If you were a good person, it wouldn't happen to you. Now, I know what you're thinking. What do you mean? I'm not doing anything bad, but I still have a bad wife, he's thinking. First of all, the fact that you married a bad wife, it's also your fault. If you are a decent person, Hashem wouldn't give this kind of wife to you. The Gemara says like this, that the Gemara starts, uh, and, uh, and the Gemara says like this, Mezavgim lo la'adam zivug lefi ma'asav. A person gets his soulmate according to who he is. If he's a kosher person, he gets a kosher wife. If he's not a kosher person, he doesn't get a kosher wife. But that's not what the Gemara said. The Gemara says like this. Rashi writes uh, on this Gemara. This is Gemara. It's very important because all the Shiduchim you learn from this Gemara. The Gemara says like this. Tznu'a uh, la tzadik, modest woman to the righteous man, and prutza la rasha. I repeat. Usually, you have tzaddik and tzaddiket, right? Tzaddik and tzaddikah. Parutz and prutza. Rasha, reshait. Good, good. Yeah. It's all together. Over here, it's different. Rasha, rasha, not reshait. Rasha, not wicked guy, not wicked girl. Not, that's not what the Torah used. Prutza. Woman that is not modest. She goes like a magnet to the wicked person, and a person that is a tzaddik get ishat snua. Let's see who is clever here. Why Hashem, instead of using tzaddik, tzaddika, rasha, reshait, he changed, he changed the category. Tzaddik with the modest woman. Rasha with the not modest woman. Why? Why? Like what do we learn from here? Well, it's like a plus and minus, so you should see. But what do we learn from it about the life of a woman? What do we learn? She's created for him. Let's save time. The answer is... It's not fair. The answer is that the most important thing, almost everything in the life of the woman, if she's a modest woman or not. That's automatically make her righteous or not, more than any other mitzvah. So that means if a woman is very modest the way she dressed, almost for sure she does everything else. If she passed this test, the rest is easy. If she doesn't pass this test, she fell her life. Everything else she does won't make her pass the test. What is it like? You go to school. The teacher give you one complicated question and he tell you this is 60% of your mark. And then he give you another 20 questions. All together it's 40. 40 points. Each question, two points. But one question, 60 points. What's better, to pass that one question and fail all the other uh, uh, 40, the other 20, or to fail in that question and pass the entire 20? What's better? To pass the one. If you pass the one, you already have 60%. You already passed the test. The rest is extra. You need to pass. You know, modesty in the life of a woman, it's at least 60% of her mission. If she's modest, right there she has 60%. Now everything else, Shabbat, Kashrut, Chesed, Tehilim, Davening, this, all together 40. Sometimes we find religious women keep Shabbat, Pray every day, read Tehillim, eat kosher, cook kosher, teaching their children good things, being a good wife, but dress very bad. Tight clothes, all kinds of bad colors, everything open, everything is, you know, clear, all kinds of things. The skirt is too, 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 too short, or pants. I'm not talking about those who, two hours before they leave the house, they think, how do I make problems on the street? I'm talking a woman that wants to be religious, but she doesn't dress according to Hashem's will. But she keeps everything else. She still have a very serious problem. 
because we see that a Kadosh Baruch Hu say tzaddik, to be tzaddik you need to do many things for the man. Torah, learning Torah, tzedakah, midot, pray three times a day, kosher, so many things. A man, to become tzaddik, it's a combination of many things. A woman is one thing, modesty or not. And you know how many religious women that keep Shabbat are completely not modest? Mm -hmm. Completely not modest. They're not sanua. Dress not good. That's ruining, that's what ruins the blessing of the entire house. The wife is the foundation of the house. If she's a modest woman, the children are blessed. The blessing in a the house, there's blessing in a marriage. If she's not a modest person, the more people look at her on the street, the more problem, thank you, the more problem she's going to have with her husband. Now we're beginning to see the problems of the Shlom Bay that we have in this generation. Why our grandmother, even the ones who stopped keeping Shabbat, the one who came from Iran, from Bukhara, from Iraq, from all these countries, when they came to Israel, they stopped keeping Shabbat. Why? Because the government made Israel a communist country and they cut all the religion and they put their children in places that they couldn't, there's not, nothing else. Some of them they put in a kibbutz, places like this. And what happened in the end? The old people eventually started to drive on Shabbat. The, the son come with the car, take her with the car. But none of these old women were dressing not sanua. Everyone, even the one who started to become a Halel Shabbat, even she eat a lot of worms when she eats. She doesn't clean the leather, she eats a lot of worm. One thing all our grandmothers have is modesty. That's why even when they became not religious, they didn't have any problem in a Shlom Bayit. Not religious, not religious, even communist, even anti-religion. When the woman was dressed modestly, nice white skirt, everything covered, none all the colors that the women put today to attract attention, almost nobody got divorced. Almost nobody got divorced. Today, in almost every house that they keep Shabbos, they pray, they eat kosher, they do a lot of things according to the Torah, but the woman is not modest, there is no blessing in a marriage, no blessing in a house. So what's the source? Everything start and finish with the wife. If there's no shlom bayit, the woman should not come to cry to the rabbi. First she has to change her modesty. Then if it didn't help, then you come to the rabbi. Don't waste your time, come to the rabbis to make shlom bayit. If you want to continue to dress short sleeves, tight, uh, all kinds of stretch things that attach to the body and attracts attention in a wedding. If you want to continue to be like this, Hashem, cannot stand you. I repeat, I know it's hard to hear the truth. Hashem cannot stand you. You read Tehillim, he closed the door for you. you. Everything you do, Hashem says, I'm not interested in you until you dress like a human being. Once you dress like a human being, then I'll look at you. Right now, you can talk to the wall. Nothing will help you. Why? You're not a modest woman and I cannot stand you. Where does it say it in the Torah? Where does it say it in the Torah that women who do not dress, Hashem cannot stand them? Where does it say it? Two weeks ago we read Parashat Balak. One week ago, now it's Pinchas. One week ago, Bilam was hired by Balak to curse the nation of Israel, that thousands of them will die and they lose the war. And you know, Hashem told him, don't dare, I'm not giving you permission, okay. In the end, Bilam told them, listen, I cannot curse. God told me don't curse. But I give you one advice. Put the women, all the goyot that are not modest. Now I promise you, the goyot of that generation was much more modest than the rabbit sense today. In case you didn't understand, right? The goyot that they are putting on the streets in the time of Bilam, 3,300 years ago, that means they picked up their dress all the way to the knee. That's it. That's already in a Torah called a prostitute. According to the Torah, a girl that sits and pick up her dress, she wants to eat her leg. She pick up the dress to the knee. To the knee, not to all the way up like today. To the knee. What happened? Hashem say, Lord, I don't want to save in this world. Very bad. 
So now Bilam said to him, put girls on the street, everybody will fall in this trap. So the girls started to walk in the street, and the Jews went and started to look at them, and thousands of Jews died. Why? Because Bilam told him a sentence. Bilam was a prophet. Bilam told him, Elokehem shel ele sone zima. The God of this nation hates problem with modesty. When there is problem with modesty, the tragedies begin. You understand? Tragedies begin. Every, you know, I want to tell you a story that for you to understand. Uh, my, my friend, Yuval Ovadia, he makes movies. All the movies that you see to make people religious, almost all of them he makes. He used to be in Hollywood. Baruch Hashem, Hashem helped me to help him to become religious. Then he went to Israel, he became very serious. And now he makes a lot of movies. Gog Magog, Final Journey, Informatia Elokit, Saada, many movies he makes. Okay, now. He, he recently made a movie about the wigs. How terrible it is that religious women walk with not modest wigs. Now, you know, most Sephardic women don't wear wigs. The problem is exist more by the Ashkenazim world. Because over there, the rabbis are allowing it. Most of the Ashkenazim, the rabbis allow them, allow them to wear wigs. But the, even the rabbis don't mean that the woman will wear a wig like she is. Short wigs, according to the Ashkenazim, they allow it. For the Sephardim, there's no permission for a Sephardi woman to put a wig even one minute, even in her house. No permission, nothing. It's, not, it's against the halacha. She has to cover her hair. If she's alone with her husband, she doesn't need to cover the hair alone, if the kids are not around. She doesn't need any cover. She can be with her husband in a room, no problem. But once there are people in the house, friends, neighbors, eh, the children, she must cover her hair 100%. He made a movie about the wigs. In that movie, they interview a head of a department in the Israeli hospital. Do you know what happened? You know, there's a hospital here in Manhattan in York Avenue, York Avenue, that all the miserable people are dying there, one after the other. Horrible place. Almost everyone who comes in doesn't come out. So over there, in Israel, you have the same thing. There's hospital for this kind of people with cancer, God forbid. The not religious doctor said that there was two weeks that there was 84. If I remember the number correctly, it was 84 or 80 something children that have cancer. Two weeks from this date to this date, a miracle happened. This is not a religious doctor. He doesn't know anything about religion. The, the hospital, all the, all the cancer patients, little kids, one after the other became healthy and got out of the hospital. In two weeks, only three kids left in a department of kids with cancer. You know what happened in these two weeks? The big rabbis in Israel found out that all the wigs that the women buy comes from hair of Indian women from India. What's the, what's the problem of Indian hair? What, Italian hair is better? Hair is hair, what's the difference? The difference is that in Italy, when a woman shave her hair and she wanna sell it to make a wig, she doesn't take the hair and put it in front of Buddha and sacrifice it to the phony God. Because they're not doing it in Europe. Nobody does these things. But in India, the poor people, that come to give something to their phony gods, they don't have money, that's very poor people. So what do they have? Only one thing they can give, their hair. So they shave their hair, and they bring the hair in a basket in front of these idols, these statues. And then what happened? They have piles of tons of hair. All the hair, they don't know what to do with that. So they sell it to a, a, a professional wig maker in Italy. They buy all this hair, and from that they make wigs, custom hair. Now, what the problem is? The Torah says that everything that was used to serve an idol, there's no permission to touch it, no permission to use it, definitely not to put it on your head, on your brain, on your soul. The soul is in the head. So a woman put this wig 
this week came from Avodah Zarah. This week came from an idol that they worship, right? And now he comes to a woman in Bnei Brak. So all the rabbis in Israel say to throw all the wigs to the garbage. There's no permission to use it. All of a sudden, thousands of thousands of Ashkenazi religious women dump their wig and finally put hats or mitpachat and they cover their hair for two weeks. Until, of course, the way the Yetzer Hara is, everybody went back to it. But in these two weeks, the hospitals almost became empty from the kids with cancer. Do you know how many kids are dying because of lack of modesty? How do I know? You don't need to be a genius. Just read the Torah. All the biggest tragedies that the Jewish people had was because of women that are not modest. Here, this parasha, remember me, in two days in Shul. Pinchas ben Elazar HaKohen eshiv et chamati. The Jew come, is a president of a tribe, which means a chief rabbi of queens. The chief rabbi of queens. It's somebody important, no? You don't just become a rabbi like that, and definitely not the chief of all the other rabbis. It's a head of a tribe, Zimri ben Salu his name. He fell in love with the princess from the Goim. What? Donald Trump's daughter, a princess. She, she say, okay, I want to be with you. So listen, you know, I'm Orthodox Jew, you know. No problem, I'll be with you, I'll follow your religion, no problem. He brings her to the nation of Israel and take her into his house. And they went to make a scene. Moshe Rabbeinu was in shock. He never believed that something like this can happen in front of his eyes. So Moshe froze. Everybody outside was standing and crying. Not like today. Oh, your cousin is going out with a Goya? Ah. I wish he wouldn't do it. Okay, so what's the, what's the weather for tomorrow? Where are we going on vacation? Nobody cares, really care. If you care, you wouldn't sleep at night that your cousin is about to marry a Goya. You wouldn't be able to sleep. You wouldn't be able to eat. My cousin is going to die for eternity, not for 20 years. If you know your cousin dying from cancer, can you enjoy your meal? No, unless if you hate him. That's a different story. But if you love him and you know he's dying, can you enjoy a steak now? When you know you just heard that your cousin is dying, he has two weeks to live. What happens if he loses eternity? That's even worse than losing 20 years. Right? So what's going on here? So everybody outside standing and crying that a Jew is making a scene with a non-Jew. Pinchas go with a big sword. He stuck it in their body, both of them together, when they're together in bed. He picked them all up in the air, and he brought them all out in front of the entire nation of Israel dead. If it would happen today in Israel, you know what would happen to Pinchas? He would be, he would be 30 years in prison, and they put him in isolation. He won't be able to see anyone, no visitation, no nothing. What does the Torah say? The Torah says Pinchas deserve a big, big prize, a huge reward for killing the Jew that made the sin with his Goya. He didn't marry her. He was just with her one time. He killed him. Hashem say, great. That's what the Jew that betrayed me deserve. And he took him out. Still, still, thousands of people died. Still, thousands of people die because a Jew made a sin with a Goya. Multiplied by the amount of uh, Jews, American, Israeli, Bukharian, Russian. If you check one night what's happened here in New York from Jews and non-Jews, believe me, you pull your hair out. Then you'll understand why we have so many tragedies. One person made a sin, thousands died. Thousands fell and died, epidemic. What's gonna happen here? I wanna give you an example what I mean. This is also one of the reasons, maybe. One of the reasons. One of the reasons. Yeah. Now, I give you another example. It says in the Torah, a person who made a sin with an animal, he went and did a sin with the animal. Whose fault it is? The fault of the person, the sick person, or the fault of the animal? Person. Huh? Person. Who is guilty? Person. Who are we angry at? Person. We angry at the cow or we angry at, uh, at uh, or that person, Mr. X? Person. Mr. X, right? The Torah say, kill Mr. X, 
kill that Jew and kill that cow also. Stone the cow, don't eat the body of the cow, don't eat the meat, take the cow and stone it to death. Now everybody asked to kill the Jew, as he made one of the worst sins in the Torah. Even Mechal el Shabbos, the Torah said to execute him, to kill him. And that's a very big sin, to make such a sin. So we understand, because it's in the Torah, we know the rule. But why the animal? Hashem is fair. He doesn't punish anyone because of something it's not in his hand. So Hashem says like this. Because of that cow, or sheep, or whatever it was, my son lost his share to the world to come. One Jew is getting cut now out of eternity. That's it. I'm not letting him enter heaven ever again. He's finished. Because of that, one of my children, I lost him for good. I cannot look at this animal ever again. Destroy it. Destroy that animal. Why? Every time I look at this animal, what's the first thing I think about? This son of mine that because of that cow, not the cow, the cow is not his fault. Now let's learn, let's be clever. If a cow that doesn't have a free choice, the cow doesn't know what is sin, what's not a sin. The cow doesn't have Torah. The cow doesn't make sins. The cow didn't come to the man and come and say, come make a sin with me. The cow did not forget to dress. If the cow that is innocent gets such a punishment, stoned to death, imagine what's going to happen to the Jewish girls that walk naked on the street all their life. How many thousands of people lose their Olam Abba because of them? By looking at them or making sins with them? If a cow that is not guilty got such a punishment, what's going to happen to our daughters and cousins and wives who they walk in the street naked? So whose fault it is? The husband. What kind of a normal husband allow his wife to go to the supermarket or on the street here when she's not dressed? How can it be? Rabbi, she claimed that it's hot. Over there it's much hotter. It's better to be hot here than over there. Rabbi, but she doesn't listen to me. She doesn't listen to me. Where were you when you married her? Don't you know rule number one in the Torah? Find a kosher wife. A modest wife, didn't you see what the Torah, what the Gemara say? A kosher, wo a modest woman to a righteous man. A prutza. You know what a prutza mean? The worst title that a woman can get in a Torah. That she doesn't dress properly. Somebody like that, somebody like that goes to a bad person. If you were righteous, you wouldn't get this wife. You understand why it's your fault? You didn't behave and this is what you got. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you want to do something in a neighborhood, you have a mutual yard with all the neighbors, and you want to build a store in the middle of the neighborhood for yourself to make business, you allowed or no? You want to make a business here in the neighborhood. You open yourself a booth, and you begin to sell. You put your truck, boxes, in the middle of the grass here. And you begin to you open the business right here downstairs. Allowed or not? Or it's against the law? What do you think? <laughs> no, in the middle of residential, you go in the middle of the grass, you have a lot of neighbors, the neighbor comes down on a Sunday morning, they see you open up a store, you're selling shish kebab, like this, in the middle of the neighborhood. It's illegal, right? You needed permission from all the neighbors. Today we have the town, but I'm talking now, forget the town, the neighbors. You need every one of the neighbors to agree that you can uh, park your car in the middle of the grass, no? The Torah say, what happens if a woman wants to make a hole in the ground in the neighborhood because she wants to make laundry? She wants to make laundry. What's the options? How they used to make laundry in the old days? They had to go all the way to the lake and wash the clothes in the water. Or they make a hole in the ground and water comes out from the ground and they use this water one way or the other. There's no other way. The Torah asks a question. When a woman wants to make herself a little hole that she can make laundry, does she need to ask permission from all the neighbors or she can just go and make a hole in the middle of the neighborhood and make laundry? What do you think? She needs to ask permission or she, she, she can just go and make a 
a laundry machine for herself. What do you think? Usually, she needs permission. The Gemara says she doesn't need permission, she's allowed. Even if the neighbors don't like it. Listen good, why? Listen, listen good. What the Gemara say? What is the other option? Is it possible for a Jewish woman to go to the lake to do laundry? Where did you hear about a Jewish woman that go to do laundry in the lake when people walk by, men, on their horses? It's the street. Goim, Jews, they're riding on the donkey, on a camel. She stand by the lake. She cover completely. You don't see anything of her body, not like today. Everything is very tight and small. Very big. When she bend down, believe me, you don't see anything. But just the thought of riding your horse and looking on the right, a woman next to the water bending down like this, it's already a little bit not modest. There is no way in the world that a Jewish woman will agree to do such a thing. So what's the other option? All the Jewish women allowed to make a hole in the neighborhood, put water, and make the laundry, and etc., etc. What are we seeing from here? Look where we are and compare to the requirements of the modesty. A Jewish woman will not dare to go and do laundry in a lake? What, she went to attract men over there? She's a, man, she's a mother to children. She needs to do laundry. No, no, no. It's not modest. It's Busha for Hashem that he has such a daughter that she goes on the public to do laundry. Imagine if the Torah was be written today. You know what would happen? Hashem say, I had the Torah to give you, but I changed my mind. I can't give you the Torah. Well, I'm going to make a fool out of myself. Look how you behave like animals. I'm going to give you the Torah. If you're 80% good, the Torah can take and make the extra 20% for you. But if you zero, 5,000 mi minus. Nobody really behaves like a person, bichlal. What the Torah is going to do? What do you think? Torah is hocus pocus? Ah, you begin to learn Torah and you become Eliyahu Navi. First, you have, that's what the Torah say. First, you make the person a human being. And then you begin to teach him Torah. You don't teach Torah to pere Adam. To a wild beast, you don't teach Torah. First, you make him a human being. Man and woman. How do you make a man human being? Not to be angry, not to be violent, to watch his eyes, to watch his behaving. How do you make a woman a human being? First, to dress like a human being. Animals are naked on the street. They are allowed. But people are not allowed. Isn't it a shame that the Muslims that come from a nation who murder so many of our children will be more modest than us when they don't even have anything from God? No book, no prophet, no nothing. Whatever they say, they're hallucinating. They have nothing. The Quran is nonsense, and the prophet Muhammad never gave any prophecy. He's not a prophet. So someone who has nothing from Hashem would listen to Hashem more than Hashem's children? Now you understand, I hope, I hope, why every house is collapsing. Now you understand. I promise you, if the mother is holy and kosher, I know there is a very strong desire to look like all the bad ladies on the street. I know it. She goes to wedding, she's jealous, I'm the only one who came with a hat, everyone comes here with a wig, everyone comes here, they dress like this, they want to show their diamond necklace that the husband got them from the anniversary, all these things, and I'm not going to be in style, they think that I'm an old fashioned, there's only one solution to all this nonsense. You have to convince yourself once for all that you don't care about people at all, only about Hashem. You don't care. I always tell the same thing to my wife. I don't understand why will you care about the opinion of any person in this world. Why do we care about them? They're going to protect us in our trial? They're going to tell us, oh, you know, you this, you that, it's my fault. I, I convinced you to do the wrong thing. I made fun at your, at, your, at your hat. I'm the one who gave you an advice to dress like this. They're going to come and admit you think? They're going to come and say, Hashem, it's not her fault, it's my fault. I, I was brainwashing her to dress like this. It's really my responsibility. It's not going to help. You are responsible for your own sins. That's why I say, who cares what the other people think about your wedding? Anyway, a week later, nobody remember you married, Bichlal. 
The few weddings I went, sometimes the people come to me and say, hey, how are you? I said, do I know you from somewhere? What do you mean? You were in my wedding, you made a bracha. I don't even remember Bechlal is married. Who, can, who remember Bechlal? Maybe your brother and sister and your parents and your five uncles remember. That's it. Nobody has care. How was your wedding? Why would you spend fifty, a hundred thousand dollars to make five thousand scenes a minute? And the night that you get married, and then you're surprised why every day of your life is nightmare with your marriage. If you start something against God, the marriage institution is God's invention. He made it. He invented men and women. He said, this is plus, this is minus, negative, like in electric, it goes together. No plus and plus, no minus and minus, like some fools trying to convince us that their way is the right way. No. There's one way of the manufacturer of the world. And one of the things he say, everything will start holy, pure, clean, will have blessing forever. And everything start rotten. It's like we're now building a building without foundation. No foundation. You can continue to build until tomorrow. It's just a matter of time until it collapses. So remember, when your children come to get married, don't be pressure but what your brother and sister did for their own children. Whatever they did, it's not your problem. You make a simple party. First of all, don't make a show off. You doesn't need 15 different meals in, a, in one night. This, shish kebab, lamb, steaks, fish, that, another fish. All night eating, 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 spending $200,000, 30 years paying the wedding of your children, 30 years like a slave. For what? that in the end, it all count one huge sin for you. Why? Mix. Sometimes they start separate. As soon as the rabbi leave, right away they take all the trees, and the party begin. And then 30 years, the children cry. No children, children with problem, autism, problem. He threw his wife. Today we had a woman called my wife. Her husband threw her out of the house and took all the children away and she sleeps in a park. She has a bag, garbage bag with her clothes already for weeks like this. We just found out today that she sleeps in the parks here. You understand what's happening? The people religious, religious people. Husband with beard, everything. Threw her out of the house, took the children away from her and she sleeps in the parks. And every we, all week she's thinking about if she will have a place to be on Shabbat. You understand what's going on? When something starts not kosher, it's impossible to make it kosher anymore. It's too late. You want to get married and have success? I always tell people, you, or, you have a girlfriend, right? Okay, you already made a lot of sins. Now you woke up. Better late than never, no? Don't think that what you did is gone. You're going to pay for everything one way or the other. Even if you make perfect tshuva, you still pay. The brothers that sold Yosef to the Arabs, they made tshuva, no? They apologized. They, besides that, they were okay. When they came in front of Yosef, Yosef forgave them. So why they had to come back again to life in Gilgul, in reincarnation, and the Romans slaughtered them like animals, cut them with knives, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Ishvav, all of them is Asara, uh, the ten brothers of Yosef. One by one, they were butchered like the poor kid two days ago. What happened to that kid? That's what happened to the holiest rabbi 2,000 years ago. Why? Because they threw their brother to the hole. But they made tshuva, but you still pay for it. Every time you're with your girlfriend, that's his tour karet. It's not a joke. 10 minutes of pleasure, 10 million years of suffering. Make it clear to yourself. You know what it means, karet? Karet means. You were supposed to enter to the world to come, to heaven, and because of that sin that you made with your girlfriend or with your wife, if she doesn't go to the mikveh, now Hashem cut you out. He took you out like taking a tree from the ground. That's it. This tree is finished. You try to plant it again, it won't help. You disconnected him, it's finished. So what's the point? Every time the Torah says, V'nichreta nefesh haim Yisrael, in Hebrew means, I cut that nation out of Israel. Wow, what a disaster. You know what a punishment? What a punishment. But Rabbi, she's very sensitive. She's in love with me. 
you know, all kinds of excuses they give. Who cares about this nonsense? You have the truth right now. The truth comes before your desires, before your pleasure, before your illusions, before all your infatuations, whatever you have. First, the truth. Allowed, not allowed. Let's finish with one last story, and then if you have questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. In Brighton Beach, in Brooklyn, an old man arrived from Russia with his wife, without children. The man is very, very quiet. Hardly speaks English. He comes to the synagogue every day. He sits in the back. Hardly talks to anybody. Good morning, good morning, finished. One day, the old man does not show anymore to, to, to shul. The rabbi see that he disappeared. He called his wife. She said, I'm very sorry, my husband died. He died. Tomorrow is the funeral. So the rabbi said to her, who was helping you? She said, I don't know anything here. Okay, let me call Hebrat Kadisha, let me see. The rabbi asked in the shul, the old man that was sitting here in the back passed away. Tomorrow morning it's his funeral, I need at least ten men, nine more besides me that at least we can say Kaddish for him because he doesn't have children. It's a big chesed, chesed imametim. When you come to do the kindness to someone who died, that's a pure kindness. Why? Because you know there's nothing you can get in return from him. He's dead already. He won't get you a job tomorrow when you need him. He won't help you tomorrow when you're in jail. He's going to come to get you out because one time you did a favor to him. All the favors people do to each other in the back of their mind, while well, I'm going to need him, I'm going to have who to rely on. I am a lawyer and he's a doctor. I'll do this for free for him. Tomorrow when I need a doctor for my, uh, for my children, I'll know where to go. This is how people always interact. But when you do a chesed to the, poor man, to the, to the dead man, there's nothing he can give you. It's finished. He's not here anymore. So the rabbi is trying to encourage them to take a day off from work, give up the greed for the money that everybody's so in love with the money, and come in at least half a day to make a funeral for the man. With all the rabbi's beautiful speech, only seven people showed up. No, no minyan. So they stand in a, synagogue, in a cemetery, and the rabbi say to the wife, usually I say eulogy, but I really didn't know your husband. You know, he was coming in and out of the shul. He never spoke to me, he never told me anything. All I know is that you live here, you came from Russia, and you don't have children. That's all I know about you. So I see that you don't have anybody from your side came to the funeral, besides the people from the shul. So I don't know what to tell you. So the wife said, can I say something for my husband? So the rabbi said, you know, usually a woman does not speak in front of a man. It's not modest. But since the situation is very strange, speak few words. So the woman say one, one, one sentence, she said. Do you know why my husband and I don't have children? What does it have to do now with the, with the funeral? It's, when we were in Russia, we were very poor. We live far away from any Jewish community. But we're very religious. <clears throat> the, from the day we got married, we found out that there is no mikveh in the entire town. No mikveh. And we couldn't, I could not go to the mikveh. So always we had a dream that one day we're going to have some money that we can move into a Jewish community. It's much more expensive where the Jews live. Always. Always. The most expensive neighborhood in America, that's where the religious Borough. Jews live. Borough Park. A, a, an apartment that in another place would cost sixty, seventy thousand dollars is a million and a half dollars. Why? Because it's all religious people. Looks like garbage. Some of this neighborhood look like the worst neighborhood in uh, who knows where. But just because it's all religious and everybody wants to live there, the price is outrageous. That's how it is. Lakewood used to be very cheap. Everybody went there. Oh, up all of a sudden, in every little apartment, half a million dollar. It's nothing. Place. Everywhere around, go to Monsi. Monsi expensive, everywhere around, nothing. Not even half of the price, not even half of the taxes. <laughs> Completely different. Brooklyn, neighborhoods, one block here, $400,000 a house, two blocks away, $10 million, the same size. Why? All Syrian wants to be in a community. 
prices go up for no reason. Why? Close to the shul, close to the neighborhood, close to the rabbi. The price go up. That's how it is. So the woman said, we had a dream that we'll be able to move out of there one day. But it took years and years and years, and we didn't have money. And one day, finally, when we got money, we decided to move to the United States. We were already older people. I was close to 50, and him. So we took the money and, and came to America. When we came to America, I couldn't become pregnant anymore. I was an older woman. For 20-something years, from the minute my husband and I got married, even though we loved each other very, very much, he never touched me even once in my hand because there was no mikveh in town. That's why we don't have children. You know, the rabbi and all the people started to cry from shame. We complain, we don't have this, we don't have this. Look at this man, what he, what he went through. Mary is love in their 20s. Your beautiful wife next to you coming, taking a shower, in, out. 25 years, you live with her in the house and you cannot touch her. Today, people, they, they will go away on a business trip. 12 hours, he's already calling, Rabbi, I have to make a scene here. Why, I'm two days without my wife. 25 years. 25. So the rabbi started to cry. The rabbi said, now I know why nobody came to this funeral. Nobody in this generation has the merit to participate in a funeral of such a holy person. Now the rabbi is eating his heart. If I wish I knew that such a righteous man sitting in my own shul didn't say anything. I didn't know who he is. This is just to show you the importance of mikveh, of modesty, of relationship. The worst punishments in the Torah, you should know it, are all sex crimes. The worst punishment, besides Shabbat and Chilul Hashem, all the relation uh, sins, all of them, all the Gilu'i Arayot, homosexuality, all animal things, is the sixth place in hell, Gehenom. There are seven places. The, the top one is Mador Rishon, then it's second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. The worst one is the seventh. The sixth one is almost the worst one. All the sex crimes are in the sixth. The worst punishment. Only Mechalel Shabbat, a Jew that doesn't keep Shabbat, and making not, make, uh, making Chilul Hashem, people looking at him, he's doing bad things with his yarmulke, and like we have in this week, the whole world looking at the Jews like the monster because of this fool, whatever he did, even though it's not normal, nobody cares that it's not normal. Person that just butchered the boy and cut him to pieces and go to work an hour later and, wo and function at work. You know, if, if, if a normal person did it, for one month his hand wouldn't stop shaking once he realized what he did. Sometimes it happened that a person loses his mind for an hour. There's a question like this in Lela Seder, if a person lost his mind and he ate matzah and then he went back to, to be normal. For one hour he had an attack, he became crazy, hyper, manic depression, all kinds of things. And he didn't, and, and he wasn't in a, in a normal conscious when he made that mitzvah. Does he have to do the mitzvah again of eating matzah or no? The answer, he must do it again with bracha. Because when he wasn't normal, when he, he did the mitzvah, it doesn't count. Because shoteh, someone who is not normal in his mind, mental problem, is dismissed from keeping mitzvot. So that one hour that he had an attack, that he lost his uh, insanity, that hour, any mitzvah he did is nothing. He has to do it again. Why? It, it was like out of this world at the moment that he did it. Same thing here. Sometimes people lose their mind, but then when they come back to reality, they sit and cry for what they did forever. Going to work as usual? Hard to believe. But the point is that we're saying, uh, like I said, to finish here, Remember, there are very, very serious prices to pay. And remember, you want Shlom Bayit, now of course the husband has to learn, he has to learn Torah, he has to work on his midot. If people do not correct their character, they cannot correct their, their personality, then it's very difficult to communicate together. It's always ego problem, he's being stingy, he doesn't buy her, he doesn't give her, he's, give, he's putting her down, he keeps telling her, I, I wish your uh, Osavor would be like my mother. 
He just murdered his, med his, his marriage. Comes to his wife, a month after they married, uh, you know your, uh, your shpolo is not as good as my mother. I want you to go next Shabbat to see how my mother makes it. He could be right. Your mother has 30 years of experience. This is a little girl, 19 years old. Only, a, a, I don't want to say what, a complete fool is going to tell his newlywed wife that she just got married to him, check for, learn from my sister, learn from my mother, learn from my grandmother, you don't know how to do this, why there's always a mess, putting her down, taking, making her lose all her, all her confidence, and then when she become pregnant, he begins to tell her, you know, you gain weight. Or after she gives birth, oh, you're so fat, what's gonna be with you? You don't wanna do anything with yourself? And then he comes to the rabbi, rabbi, I think my wife is cheating on me. It's hard to believe because by us it's not really happening in our tradition, but uh, it has to be. I say, well, what makes you think so? Well, for two months she's avoiding me. Every time I come, you know, she got a headache, I have to go to my mother, my mother is waiting for me, I don't feel good, I have stomach pain, this, that, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe I'm nida, I have to go to the rabbi to check. Always find me an excuse. I check the computer, nothing. I check the cell phone, nothing. I check, I follow there, nothing. She doesn't have anyone. She goes to work, she come home, she stay home. Ever, everything is fine, but I'm telling you, I feel it. Uh, it happened to me once. I told the guy, let me ask you a question. Did you recently by any chance told your wife that she gained weight? So yeah, she did gain weight. <laughs> okay, your marriage is over. Now it's gonna take, with, take you 20 years to return the situation before you made that foolish statement. 20 years, why? She already lost her confidence being next to you. She always gonna hide herself. Car, hiding, blanket, towel, walking like this, like a penguin, <laughs> try to, that you don't see, turning the lights off. Why? She lost her confidence. She has one man in her life, and now he told her what he thinks about her. Or what, what does he think about her for? Then he wants Shlom Bayit. Shlom Bayit, Rabbi. Shlom Bayit. You understand? The way you are, that's what you get. You're going to be a good husband. Most of the problem, if you're going to work on yourself one month and you be a good husband, you treat your wife like a queen, even if she's the laziest, even if she has bad character, even if she's jealous and she's this and she's that, you're going to see a major improvement. You're not going to work on yourself, nothing will ever become better in your house. Same thing the children. They all learn from you. Whatever you bad, they become also like this. Whatever you good, they may learn from you, may not. But whatever you bet, for sure they learn from you. Whatever you bet, they learn from you. They see how you pray, they see how you talk, they see how you lie, they see how you talk to your wife, they see how you treat food, they see that all your life is food and your growing stomach by the minute. That's all you care about your life. And if your, the wife didn't make it the most delicious in the world for two weeks, you're abusing her, what's going on with you? You forgot how to cook? Yes, I'm gonna send you to a course, make sure it's kind of, <laughs> You know, one guy happened to be Bukharian. <laughs> he had uh, four girls. Four girls. And now he said to his wife, listen, I'm warning you. If you have one more girl, don't come back home. <laughs> don't come back home. So what happened to him? Actually, there's two different stories. First, the little story, and then the, be the best story for you to go home with a smile. The first story is, that now he made a sonogram. And they told him, oh, this time you have a boy. And I was so happy. He was laughing at my brother, laughing at other people who had few girls. I said to my wife, this guy is speaking with overconfidence. He probably knows he has a boy. That's why he make fun out there. Because what, he had four girls, they have three girls, and he laughs at them. He knows there's a boy on the way. So for sure it's going to be a boy. And then he went to the hospital. And they come to him and say, Mazal Tov! It's a girl! <laughs> you should see how he started to scream. <laughs> Push her back there! Don't, what do you mean? You made a mistake, I sue you! <laughs> so what do you mean, we? We didn't tell her. Do you, so go to your doctor, what do you want from him? No, they told me it's a boy! So he had, he had an extra girl. That's one story. He had to, to live with that. Then, there's another story like this, in Israel this time. I don't know if it was Bukharian or not. You decide. <laughs> so the guy said to his wife, if you have one more girl, don't even come home. 
take her to your mother and stay there forever. Don't call me. So now the doctor see that when the wife came to the hospital by herself, which is not so common, she's very nervous. The doctor said to her, are you okay? You don't look good. You already gave birth a few times. You're not supposed to be so afraid of, the, of giving birth, no? She said to him, doctor, it's not me, it's my husband. He drove me crazy for nine months. Be careful not to have a girl, be careful not to have a girl. Now I'm thinking if I have another girl, my life is finished. How do you want me not to be nervous? So he told her, okay, let's first wait to see what you have. Maybe you have a boy, you don't have a reason. And if you have a girl, leave it to me. I promise you, I'll get you out of it. I give you my word, you'll see. So he made her relax. She gave birth. A girl, now she begins to really cry. He told her, I told you, leave it to me, no? You will see how your husband's gonna carry you like a queen back to the house. He called up the husband, hello, yes. Uh, you just had a baby boy. A boy! So why are you so upset, doctor? Unfortunately, this boy is handicapped, problem, one kidney small, one big, all, all in a long. He can probably won't survive more than two, three months. And heart defects, Hashem Yerachem, all the problems in one, I never saw such a case. Very, very bad, we connecting him to oxygen now and this. So he said to him, wow, wow, he begins to cry. Where are you, doctor? I'm here in my office in hospital, come quick. He runs quickly, he goes to the office, he comes inside. The doctor says, yeah, what can we do? <laughs> so he begins to scream, it's all my fault. I told my wife, if it's a girl, don't bring her home. Hashem punish me. Give me a boy, but who needs a boy like this? I wish it was a girl. What a fool I am. Now I'm going to pay all my life for my stupidity. He's banging his head to the wall, he's crying. So the doctor says, yes, what kind of fool tell his wife, don't come back home, what is this? Girl, don't you know that this, the, the nature of the kid, if it's a boy or a girl, it's up to the man, not to the woman. The woman is only an incubator. Whatever comes, it's you. You're the one to be blamed. And anyway, who's the fool who thinks life and death is in the hand of a person? It's all in the hands of Hashem. Hashem wanted boy, girls, he wants girls. He wants boys, he gets boys. What is this? Nuroi, doctor, I'm a fool, I'm a fool. Mazal tov, you have a healthy girl. What is this, doctor? Yeah, I just wanted to show you what a fool you really are. No, come on, don't say it. I'm telling you, come see her, she's perfectly fine. Wow, he's kissing the doctor, mwah, mwah, dancing on her. What happened? That's what happens when you don't have Torah, how much you suffer, and when you have Torah, you appreciate everything. You heard what the father of this boy said in the funeral? It was pleasure to be next to you all these years. I was lucky to have a boy like you. Hashem gave, Hashem took, Hashem may be blessed forever. That's it. I had responsibility to raise you. You finish your job here. Hashem took you to heaven. It hurts. We are people. But we know how Hashem runs the world. It's not the first time. There's tons of tragedies all the time. But later, when we go to the next world, if we be righteous, we are going to smile at all these tragedies. Because over there, it's going to be so minor. Nobody would care. I was sick, this, that. If I'm going to heaven, you think people care? Oh, I lost a million dollars. My partner stole. This, this has happened. I didn't get the house. I lost my laptop. Three months I had to find the information. Nobody would care about this. It would look like a joke. Hey, don't you want to return back to the world? To get back what you lost? Hashem, you, you're insulting me. I'm in heaven. You want me to go back to the world? I'm very happy here. This is it. But to get there, rule number one, modesty. Men and women. Men watch his eyes, not talking with the ladies. One man came to the, to the office. And the woman come half naked every day to the office in Israel. What do you want? It's hot. What do you mean hot? You're not an animal. I'm a religious man sitting with you in the same room. Put something on you. Respect other people. It's your problem, not mine. By me, it's not a problem. <laughs> you, you live your life, and I live my life. You don't tell me what to do. I don't tell you what to do. No, I'm going to give you my cheeseburger and tell you to eat? No. Comes to the rabbi. Rabbi, what am I going to do? 
should I lose my job because of this not modest woman? The rabbi said, no, tomorrow on your way to work, stop by the gas station, put a little bit of gasoline in a, in a glass, and spill it all over your clothes. Take a bad outfit of yours, make sure you're full of gasoline, and go into the office. Rabbi, you sure? That's it. When she comes to you and says, what, what is this perfume? Oh, I'm dying. Wow, what, what are you doing? You're full of gasoline. You tell her from now on, that's my daily perfume. <laughs> Every day I come with this perfume, and you're not going to tell me what perfume yeah. to put. Free world, democracy. After one hour, she'll be a rabbit scent. <laughs> and that's what happened. That's what they say in Hebrew. Ma she'lo ba derech harosh ba derech haraglaim. Whatever doesn't penetrate through the head, penetrate through the legs in a hard way. You run here, there, until you get the point. Thank you very much again, Yitzchak. I hope Bezrat Hashem will be a lot of smachot here. And soon you move even to a bigger place with lots of tzaddikim children and then everything and happiness and shalom bayit. And I hope Bezrat Hashem I never have to get a phone call from you about any shalom bayit issue. They will know the blessing took place. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen. We're done.